Let's get into the Word tonight. All right. James chapter 3, verse 13. says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Lord, tonight as we look in your word, we ask you to teach us. We ask you, Holy Spirit, guide us into all truth. God, we pray tonight that you would transform our mind. God, change us and conform us in how we think and how we live for you, God. Lord, I pray tonight that you would do a work in us, that as we look into the perfect law of liberty, we would not be forgetful hearers, but doers of the word, and that your spirit would truly do a work in us. We ask it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As we look tonight at the book of James, we're going to see once again that James begins to speak to us again on the issue of wisdom. And he is going to give us two contrasts here. He is going to give us that wisdom that comes from above, that wisdom that comes down from God, and he is going to contrast it with that wisdom that is earthly or that wisdom that is from below. And he does this by showing us the fruits that these wisdom, this wisdom produces in the lives of people and in the heart of people. And as we said when we were in James chapter 1 and verse 5, it says there that if we lack wisdom, wisdom, we ask of God. And we understand that no one has the perfect perspective on every issue in life. Amen? We all are deeply flawed when it comes to how to live our life. Not understanding the situations, not having the total perspective that we need in order to make decisions. And so we are always in a place where we need to ask God for wisdom. And God is the one who has all wisdom. All wisdom is God's. He has perfect knowledge of every situation and he knows the outcome and he knows the best way to do anything. He's God. Amen. He, he has wisdom. Wisdom belongs to him. And so when we ask of God for wisdom, we, we're asking the one who has it all. That's where it comes from. We see in God's Word as an introduction, we see that there are four ways that we get wisdom. There are four ways that the Bible shows us how you and I walk in wisdom, how we live a life that is wise. And the first thing that the Bible says about wisdom is in the book of Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. This is the first thing. This is how you get wisdom. This is where wisdom comes from. And this is what he says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It begins, wisdom begins in the heart of our life, and wisdom begins there. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so when you and I put God in the proper place in our life, when you and I honor Him and reverence Him and fear Fear Him. That's what that word fear means. It means to honor and reverence, to stand in all of Him. When we fear God, and that's the beginning, that takes care of a lot of other stuff in our life. Amen? When you begin, listen, when you begin with a fear of the Lord, that gives you a right view of the world. Amen? And a lot of the problem that we see in our world today is that, the, as the Bible says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And if we all had a holy fear of God, this world would be an utterly different place. And so wisdom begins with honoring God. That's the beginning of it. You can't go on anywhere without God. If you don't, if you don't begin with God, everything else falls apart. 
God is the source of all reality. God is the source by which our worldview is real. That means that the, it, if you don't begin with God, listen to me. How can you say anything is right or wrong if you don't have an absolute? Right? If you don't have an absolute, if you don't have, how can we sit back and tell somebody that's wrong, that's right? In a world, if we are just a cluster of cells that evolved into something, if we came from goo 10 billion years ago and we just evolved from monkeys, how is there any morality? The answer is that is a lie and it takes more faith to believe that nonsense than it does to believe in God. It really does. If you ever read at what they postulate, the origins of the universe, it's astounding that these men call themselves brilliant. When you read about where they think they came from, listen, I want to tell you something. A Coca-Cola can will never evolve into a VW bug, right? Metal will never evolve into a watch. You will never take all of the parts, right? You see, if you don't begin with God, then your whole worldview is messed up. If you don't begin with God, and so the beginning of wisdom, wisdom begins with God. You see, we all have presuppositions. We all have these things by which we presuppose reality to be a certain way. And if you don't begin with God, nothing, nothing. How can you know what you believe is right? How is the fundamental laws of logic, if you don't have an absolute bare bottom law of logic, how can you even reason correctly? You understand, if you don't begin with God, nothing makes sense. And so that's exactly what the Bible says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't start there, everything's wrong. And so if we want to walk in wisdom, it begins with fearing Him, honoring Him. And then secondly, how we get wisdom is in conversion or salvation. Now listen to me. We become wise when we get saved. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want to show you what the Word of God says about this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean we're intellectually brilliant. We're not even the cause of it. But when we receive Christ, we are born again with a new nature. And it says in verse 30, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Chapter 2, it says in verse 6, However we speak wisdom among those who are mature, not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have, not, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see there that even when you and I became born again, the wisdom from God, that true wisdom, 
Now we be, began to be able to comprehend spiritual realities. Listen to me, this is so important. The Bible is a spiritual book. It's spiritual. Jesus would say in John chapter 6, the words that I speak are spirit. When he was speaking about his body, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, he was speaking in a spiritual way. And what did they say? What? They didn't understand it, did they? They were offended at him. You see, until you got saved, you couldn't understand spiritual realities. You, the Bible, listen, the Bible before you got saved, yes, it was full of wisdom and all these good things that you should, you, we should be taught and all these things, but until you are born again, you cannot actually understand the spiritual realities of the Bible. And so we get wisdom by becoming saved, by salvation. Christ is ours. We receive the wisdom of God. In Colossians chapter 2, it tells us that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and we are in Him. We see thirdly where wisdom comes from. Wisdom comes from the Word of God. Wisdom comes from the Word of the living God. In Psalms... 119. Turn with me there. Psalms 119. Psalms 119 and verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You through your commandments make me wiser than my enemies for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are, more, are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. We gain wisdom by the Word of God. By knowing His Word, we grow in wisdom. And not just in that intellectual knowledge of knowing it, but in knowing it and then living it, by putting it into practice. And then lastly, we obtain wisdom, as James says in chapter 1 and verse 5, by prayer. We pray. We pray. We ask God for more. Because we don't have all knowledge. Even though we are new creatures and understand spiritual realities because of the Holy Spirit revealing them to us, we still have a limited view. Amen? And so we ask God for wisdom. You use the analogy like you're driving somewhere and you're going somewhere and you're stuck in traffic. You don't know why you're stuck in traffic. There could be a wreck three miles up the road. You have no idea. You don't know what's going on. Someone could have got hit by a car. You don't know the situation that's going on. But what you do is in that moment you make a decision to do what is best as you drive. You make a moment-by-moment -moment decision. And that's what we do. We ask God, God, there's something ahead of me I don't understand. I, don't, I can't see exactly what's going on. I don't know the angle that's happening. But, oh God, give me wisdom. And God helps us in those moments to navigate those times to do and make the best choice. Amen? And that's what we ask for. And that's something that I would encourage everyone to take that, take James chapter 1, verse 5, and just take it before the Lord on a daily basis. God, give me wisdom. You said, God. If I lack wisdom and I ask you for it, you'll give it. Amen. Amen. He gives to all men liberally and does not hold back. And we see this working out in verse 13. Here's what he says. Who is wise and understanding among you? It's a rhetorical question. Who is wise and understanding among you? And he goes on to show how wisdom is made clear, how it works itself out in our lives. And what, here's what he says. Let him show by good conduct 
That is, works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Here's how you see wisdom worked out. The first thing that he says there in verse 13 is good conduct. Here's how wisdom is worked out. Here's how it is on display by good conduct. By the behavior, by the fruit that it produces and how we live our life. Good conduct there is a noble and beautiful life. Let him show it by the conduct, by the way that he lives his life, by, by the works that he does. We walk this wisdom out, but let him show that his good conduct is done in the meekness of wisdom. That what is done is done in humility. The humility of wisdom. Meekness and humility are the opposite of proud and boastful. And to be meek is to walk in humility. Having meekness is this. Here, here is a very good definition of being meek. Meek is having a right view of God, a right view of yourself, and it affects how you live in light of other people. When you have a right view of God and a right view of yourself, listen, you're going to be humble. Amen? When you truly know who you are and how sinful you are and how gracious God has been to you, you're going to walk in humility. You're going to be meek. Meekness, listen, meekness is not being weak. Some people have the idea that being meek means that you're weak. That has nothing to do with being weak. Meekness, as some people would de define it, is strength under control. It's being so secure in God that you're willing to walk in humility in front of other people and you don't have to stick up for yourself and defend yourself and all of these things. Wisdom. Let him show by his good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. And I want to say to you, listen, Jesus, Jesus was the most manly man that ever lived. Jesus is the personification of manhood. He is the second Adam. That is, he is the perfect man. He is the man that you and I are to try to be like. He is the man that the Holy Spirit is making us like. And Jesus said of himself, Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden. Amen. Take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly. I am meek and lowly, and Jesus was not. When you think about it, me and Josh were on a walk the other day, and we were, I was talking about how strong Jesus was. If you think about the strength of Jesus... When you read the Gospels in John chapter 13 and he knows he's getting ready to be taken, he knows that he's getting ready to be nailed on a cross and he's still able to talk to his disciples, he's still able to minister unto them. If you knew you were getting ready to be executed, how would you act? He knew what was ahead. And he didn't have a breakdown. He didn't, oh yes, he did in the garden. We know he went into the garden and he prayed and he sought the face of God and his, his blood became like, or his sweat became like drops of blood. But he got up and he faced the cross. He's the strongest man that ever lived. Amen? There's no one stronger than Jesus. Amen? But he says about himself, I'm meek and lowly. I'm meek and lowly. So let us show by our good conduct that our works are done in the meekness of wisdom. And then he goes on in verse 14, and he shows us this contrast. Verse 14, 15, and 16. The two types of wisdom, the two types. He says in verse 14, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts... Do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Here he tells us the wisdom that comes from below. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking, if your heart is filled with selfish ambition, motivated by jealousy and envy, desiring only selfish ends and selfish gains... 
He says there, don't boast against the truth. This is not from God. He makes it clear that that attitude is not from God. That does not come from God. That type of wisdom, that type of earthly... Listen, that's natural to the world. Is it not? That's, that is a natural way. Selfish, pursuing selfish things. That's natural. That, that is of the world. That's the natural man. And he says here, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking, don't boast against it. Bitter envy is that you are angry. It's not only envious, but it's bitter. Bitter envy. You are angry and bitter about the accomplishments of others. There's a story that I read about a king. And this king had two men that were rivals within his kingdom. And he told these two men, listen, I'm going to give each of you a wish. You each get a, something that you can pick, anything that you want, but there's only one stipulation. The person that picks second gets double what the first person picks. So the first person comes and says, my wish is that you pluck out one of my eyes. You see what bitter envy will do? Bitter envy is such where you don't even want any good to be done if it's going to be done by somebody that you rival. That is a bitterness. That is an envy. That is a spirit that is not from God. That does not come from God. And sometimes the envy is so bitter that you would rather nothing good be done than to see it done by somebody that is a rival of yours. And then he says there, bitter envy and selfish ambition. Selfish ambition we read in the book of Philippians chapter 2 when he is writing to the church at Philippi, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Let nothing that you do be done with the motive of selfish ambition. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. He goes on to say in verse 15 that this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Earthly, meaning it is from below. It's from the fallen nature. It's from the fallen man. Then he goes into sensual. Sensual means that it is motivated by lust. When you see that word sensual, it always has to do with the natural impulses and lust of man. And so this, this bitter envy, this self-seeking comes from the earth, it comes from the fallen nature, and it comes from the lust of our heart. And not only is it motivated by our fallen nature and our lustful side or the sinful nature, but it is, its source is satanic. Because Satan is the source of all of that. that. That whole attitude, that type of wisdom is demonic, the Word of God says. It's motivated by Satan. And then he goes on and he says in verse 16, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Where these things are, every evil thing is there. There's confusion, there's no peace, there's chaos. When these are what rule and what dominate, there is no peace. There is total chaos. Every evil thing will begin to manifest when this is the soil of what is taking place. When this is what is the soil and the root of it, every evil thing will begin to pop out. But he goes on to contrast this. We get a picture here of the wisdom that comes from the earth. Bitter envy, self-seeking. Where these things are, this wisdom is not from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. Where these things exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And I want to tell us tonight that when these things come in, into the life even of a Christian, there will be no peace in your mind. 
Amen? You will have no peace in your heart when this is what is motivating you to do anything. Chaos, confusion, scattered thoughts, the inability to focus, all of these things, these fruits that come out of that type of earthly wisdom. But look at what he says about the wisdom that comes down from God. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. He lists seven things, seven characteristics of the wisdom that comes down from God. This is what marks heavenly wisdom. This is what you see when the, of the wisdom that comes down from above. He begins by saying, first of all, it's pure. It's pure. It's undefiled. It's morally pure. The wisdom that comes from God is first pure. You and I have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is pure. He is pure, utterly pure. Jesus, it says, He made Him who knew no sin. Jesus never sinned. Pure. Pure. And you and I, as His disciples, we seek and we strive to live a life that is pure. Pure in heart. Matthew chapter 5 said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. In 1 John chapter 3, he uses the exact same word. Turn with me there. Verse 3 says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. We desire to be pure. Purify my heart. The wisdom that God gives that comes from above is first pure. Is that your desire tonight, to be pure, pure, undefiled, no blemish? That's why we pray prayers like, search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. That's why we ask God, Lord, search my heart, see if there's something in me, God, that's not right. Because we desire to be like Christ. Amen. That's why God chastens us. In Hebrews chapter 12, he says, Don't despise the chastening of the Lord, the discipline of the Lord. For whom he loves, he disciplines. Amen. If you are his child, he will discipline you. We have earthly fathers. He goes on to say that earthly fathers, out of what? Out of love, even though they're flawed, still discipline their children, right? Some have to be disciplined more than others. Amen? Amen. Now, I can honestly say all them whippings I got when I was a kid, I don't think uh, my mom was doing it in love at the time. But now I look back and I'm like, you know what? I'm thankful that she did that. She won't watch this. I'm thankful that she beat me with that vacuum cleaner cord that once. I'm just... No, but you look back. You look back and you say, I'm thankful that my dad loved me enough to take my, his belt and whip my rear end. Amen? You don't understand it at the time. At the time, it stinks. 
and you're doing the, what do they call it? We called it the dance of pain or something where you're just running in a circle while your dad's... I'd had many of those. You get home from church. I got whipped like every Sunday after church. I'm not, I'm not even exaggerating. And I would go in and put extra clothes on. I'd be like, act like I had to go to the bathroom. I had some tricks. And then I would immediately start crying as soon as I got hit. Right? Because you knew it would be over faster. Until they got wise to what I was doing, you know. But at the time, it stinks, right? But it yields. If you're disciplined by it, if you receive it and you live under it, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness in your life. And that's what the discipline of the Lord is meant to do. It's, meant to, it's not meant to destroy you. It's meant to correct you and bring you back into line with His will so He can bless you more, so He can pour out His Spirit upon you more. Amen? So He can use you more, so He can do what He wants to do. And we all still receive that discipline from the Lord because we are His children. And we say, oh God, purify us, make us pure, make us like Jesus. And the wisdom that comes down from above is first pure. Pure, and then he says, peaceable. Peaceable. Peace-loving. This wisdom doesn't make us combative. This type of wisdom that comes from the Lord does not make us pugnacious but peaceable, but peaceable with people. This wisdom that comes down that is peaceable, we understand that we have come to know the Prince of Peace, and His peace has been given to us. And Jesus gave us His peace. We have been made at peace with God. We have peace with God through Christ. We have been brought, reconciled back to Him, and there's peace in this relationship. And when there's peace in this relationship, it comes out in these relationships. And the desire, what the Lord gives, the wisdom that He gives us, makes us peaceable. Amen? That's why we read one of the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, what? Peace. Peace. Peace with God and then peace with others. And one of the manifestations of the wisdom of God, one of the manifestations of the Spirit of God at work in the life of our, in our heart is that we pursue peace. Amen. Not, for the, not forsaking the truth. We don't sacrifice truth for peace. But I want to say something that peace is always what we want. Amen? Peace is always what we are after. We read in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, Pursue peace with all people. Pursue peace with all people. And holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Pursue peace with all people. Romans chapter 12, turn with me there. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18, it says, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Meaning there that you are not going to be the source of, you're not going to be the combative one. You're going to be your desire. Our desire when we come to the table is peace. Amen? And then he says in Romans 14 and verse 19, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify one another. Let us pursue the things that make for peace. Not compromising righteousness, not compromising the truth for the sake of these things, but we, sue, we pursue peace. And then he goes on and he says in James chapter 3, 
But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. And then he says gentle. 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 The wisdom that God gives. The wisdom that is from above produces in us a gentleness, a kindness. That is, we are considerate. And it's truly the opposite of self-seeking. When you're gentle, when you're kind and considerate, it is the opposite of a self-seeking attitude. And we, as God's people, listen to me, that doesn't mean that you as a man are weak. Doesn't mean you're not tough. Doesn't mean you can't go chop down trees and shoot deer in the head or whatever you do that but gentle. Amen? That's what God has called us to be. Gentle. And then he says the fourth characteristic is willing to yield. Willing to yield. And this literally means that you are reasonable. You are open to reason. You are teachable. You're willing to yield. You're willing to be reasoned with. You're not stubborn. You don't dig in your heels because you feel like you're right or you're done. You're willing, you, you're willing to yield. And I've seen so many problems in the life of God's people over this very thing. People are just stubborn. Want it their own way. Things have to be their way. And unwilling to yield. There's a story about Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War where he gave an order to the Secretary of War. I think his last name was Stanton. And he said he gave him this order to move troops somewhere. And the Secretary of War got it and said, Abraham Lincoln is a fool. I'm not doing this. And they sent back word to Lincoln. And Lincoln, you know, instead of doing what maybe we would have done, like, hey, man, I'm the president. You do what I say to do. He said, well, if Stanton said that, then he must have had a good reason. And he went and talked with him, and he found out that he, Stanton was right for making that decision. And Lincoln yielded to this man. Listen, that's wisdom. That's wisdom. Being teachable, willing to yield, open to reason, willing to listen. That comes from God. Reasonable. Easily entreated. Gentle, willing to yield. And then he says, full of mercy. Full of mercy and good fruits. We see these characteristics as you go through this list here. It's very similar. You know, you, James is the brother of Jesus. And as you read these, they go right in line with the Sermon on the Mount. If you go back to Matthew chapter 5 and you read about the characteristics of the kingdom, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the, they that mourn, blessed are the meek, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And he says here, the wisdom that comes from God, the attitude of the kingdom is a merciful kingdom. That is, it is full of pity. Pity in action. It is full of compassion. Full of mercy and good fruits. And then he says, impartial or without partiality. That is, that it is consistent, that it doesn't vacillate. From moment to moment, it doesn't change its judgment based upon the audience, but it is the same. It's impartial. It's single-minded and it's free from prejudice. And then he says without hypocrisy, that it's sincere. It's not just playing the part. It's not just putting on a show. There's, there's no mask. It's godly and it's sincere. This is the wisdom that comes from above. Pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It's genuine. Amen. 
And then he says, verse 18, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We see here the harvest of this wisdom. The fruit of righteousness. The harvest of righteousness is sown in the soil of peace. The fruit of righteousness, listen to me, does not grow in a toxic environment. You will not see the fruit of righteousness growing in toxic soil. You won't see growth when the soil is toxic and there's bitterness and all of these things. You won't see the fruits of righteousness. They won't be there. They don't exist. The fruits of righteousness cannot grow in the soil where there are the thorns and the, the briars of division taking root. It won't grow. There's no fruit of righteousness. The fruit of righteousness grows in the soil of peace. When there is peace, when the environment, when the atmosphere is peace within the church, among God's people, you will see the fruit of righteousness. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. That's why we read in Ephesians chapter 4 that we are endeavor, we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That means, listen, that means we have to work at it. That means it's work. We have to. Why? Because personality types are so different within the church. Amen? Because backgrounds are so different within the body of Christ. Because people come from all different walks of life. And the unifying thing is the blood of Jesus, the cross of Christ, and the Holy Spirit inside of us. But we still, listen, we still have to combat the flesh and we still have to combat some things in our life. And we have to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We have to pursue peace. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We see this again. The wisdom that comes from God. Heavenly wisdom, earthly wisdom. We see the source of wisdom. And we say once again, as James said in James chapter 1 and verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray tonight. Holy God, thank you for your word. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. And Father, tonight I pray, God, that we would walk in that wisdom that is from above. I pray, God, that we would walk in that wisdom that comes from you. Help us to show our wisdom and understanding by our good conduct, that our works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Lord, don't let us have bitter envy and self-seeking, Lord. Lord, we know that this wisdom does not come from you, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Lord, we know this wisdom does not come from the Holy Spirit, Lord, we know that where these things are, where these things exist, there's going to be chaos in every evil thing. But Lord God, help us to walk in that wisdom that's from you. God, that is gentle, that is peaceable, God, that is pure, that is without hypocrisy, that is without partiality, God, that is willing to yield, that is reasonable, God. Lord, help us tonight. And Lord, we ask for wisdom. Give us wisdom, Lord. 
Give us wisdom where we lack it and help us, God, to be who you've called us to be. Help us to walk in love with each other, endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. God, help us. Your word says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Lord, help us tonight. Help us to walk in wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.